So in the um, last uh, talk, I kind of went through uh, some of the uh, imaging for fractures and then basic uh, treatment like uh, splinting, casting, internal fixation, external fixation, arthroplasty. So we're going to move a little bit on now and talk about associated neurovascular injury. Now keep in mind, fractures don't occur in isolation, right? Uh, some, some surgeons even say that a fracture is a soft tissue injury with a broken bone associated with it. Um, so think about it that way too, that it, these things don't occur in isolation and that neurovascular injury is not always obvious. And I'm going to really emphasize this. It really requires careful and repeated examination for you know the astute clinician to make sure they're not missing something. And the reason this is important is because what you might be missing could be very disabling, you know, very disabling to the patient and you know, potentially very costly to you if it's something you miss and you know there's any legal implications. So we'll talk about vascular injury, nerve injury, and keep in mind nerve injury requires patient cooperation. You know, for most nerve examination, or I should say nerve examination, or to detect nerve injury requires patient cooperation. Um, and I'll talk about compartment syndrome, which just, you know, don't miss it. You know, make sure you uh, uh, are aware of this condition, how to diagnose it, uh, etc. So um, vascular injury can certainly occur from penetrating or blunt trauma. Uh, it requires immediate diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and uh, of course, that's because tissue death can occur within hours of warm ischemia. Uh, and uh, this involves early involvement by vascular surgery. And here you can see an example of the uh, uh, popliteal artery uh, coming down uh, to these uh, looks to be a horrible open fracture with lots and lots of bone loss and just kind of gets cut off right about there. So neurologic injury needs a cooperative patient, right? So um, if a patient is unable to talk, um, unable to communicate, uh, maybe they're intubated, whatever, um, the, the, they can't tell you if they feel anything, they won't move anything for you. I mean, you can maybe check reflexes, uh, but sometimes that's hard if it's, you have a fractured or injured extremity. Um, so uh, this can be a problem. Um, so you need a cooperative patient. You need, and you also need to do careful and repeated examination. And I really make a huge emphasis, obviously, on this. Um, because look at this example here, right? So you have a patient with a um, hip dislocation, right? Patient sitting in a car. Um, Maybe there's a uh, dashboard injury or something like that, and um, you could see there's uh, there's this energy, you know, uh, going this way. Uh, femoral head goes out the back, and then the uh, um, there's like sort of stretch injury to the uh, sciatic nerve, right? So this patient might develop some, you know, uh, sciatic nerve. Uh, Neuropraxia, perhaps they have some numbness in their foot. Perhaps they get a complete foot drop. Um, perhaps they're, it's only um, the perineal division, and that's very, very common, right? A patient can have a foot drop, sciatic nerve injury, but they can still plantar flex their toes. So you see this all the time, where you know, nurse will say, "Well, the patient's wiggling their toes," or one of the other docs will say, "Oh, patient's wiggling the toes are good," but really all they're doing is they're plantar flexing the toes, and then they just come back up to neutral uh, uh, when they let go. Uh, but they actually can't dorsiflex the toes all the way. And that's, that's important because they have a foot drop. And of course, if somebody's evolving a compartment syndrome in the lower leg, the same thing can happen. So uh, careful examination. Know what you're looking for. And repeated examination because things can change over time, right? Person comes in, they don't have, let's stick with this, let's, this example, they, they don't have a foot drop and then they develop a foot drop later. Well, why did they develop that? Uh, and then everybody looks at themselves and says, well, was the patient moving their toes? And everybody's like, yeah, they're moving the toes. I think he felt, I think he felt something. I don't know. Well, how careful were you with the examination? Maybe they felt something on the plantar aspect of the foot, but the, no one checked the dorsal aspect of the foot or the first dorsal web space. And um, now you don't know, is it an interval change or not? It's very important to be careful here. Um, 
three types of neurologic injury, right? There's neuropraxia, there's axonotmesis, and there's neurotmesis, right? So uh, neuropraxia is a sensory deficit. Axonotmesis is uh, when you have um, a, an additional degree of injury with sensory and motor deficits. And in these cases, surgery could be needed. And then there's neurotmesis, which is a disruption or severing the nerve. And in these cases, uh, you require surgery, right? So let's talk about compartment syndrome. I've made a lot of references to this. Uh, and we did talk about it a little bit in your second year uh, block. Uh, but this is when you have increased intercompartmental pressure, right? Either due to fracture or due to severe soft tissue injury. Uh, this can be due to prolonged uh, pressure or prolonged hypoperfusion to the limb. And uh, tissue ischemia occurs, which can lead to uh, muscle death. And of course, death permanent, right? So um, if this happens, uh, you potentially will have, um, I wouldn't necessarily say a dead leg, but perhaps some dead muscle. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, that can be a lawsuit or, uh, you know, a certainly very unhappy patient. So please take a minute to uh, take a look at this. I want you to just sort of fixate this in your head and you know, don't miss this when it presents itself. Um, there is a nice picture here showing a uh, fasciotomy release in a patient who had a compartment syndrome. So it's a surgical emergency. It requires immediate fasciotomies. So what are the um, uh, clinical signs, right? You have the five P's, which are pain, paresthesia, paralysis, pallor, pulselessness. So the reason I make a big deal about pain is because that's what you want to be looking for. You know, is the pain out of proportion? Do they have pain with passive stretch? Um, if it's a kid, do they just seem really anxious and you're not sure why? It just seems a little bit more than, you, than it ought to be. Because um, the problem is once you start to get the paresthesias, it might be a little too late. Certainly when you start to get into paralysis, like a patient with a lower leg compartment syndrome now has a foot drop, now you're probably in trouble and you're probably already starting to have some irreversible injury to the muscle. So, um, and of course, you know, once you have pulselessness, now you, now you actually might lose your limb. So, um, five Ps, but really, really focus on pain. And if you're snowing a patient with pain medication, you're not going to know, right? So I mean, you don't with you don't withhold medications from the patient, but you certainly also have to uh, make sure you can keep track of what they're getting and uh, that it's not excessive. Now, keep in mind that a lot of this stuff, maybe not pulses, but I mean, a lot of this stuff, especially the pain, you cannot measure uh, in an obtunded or intubated patient or a patient who has some other communication problem. So, for instance, children, especially small children. Patients who have a different language or culture um, or a psychiatric problem. And this stuff comes up. I mean, I've certainly had patients who um, were just, came, they were particularly stoic and they didn't, you know, in their culture and they didn't really speak very good English. And, you know, they seemed a little anxious perhaps, but uh, not nearly as much as some other patients. Um, and uh, we happened to somehow pick up on the fact they were having compartment syndrome, we release them and all of a sudden they're ecstatic. And now you realize that that was something maybe you could have picked up on earlier ahead of time and it was just a sort of a communication thing. And it's so, so subjective when you go with the, when you go with the pain and the five Ps that it makes compartment syndrome easy to miss. So compartment pressure measurements are the other more objective finding. The problem is it's not as easy as just slopping on a blood pressure cuff, for instance, right? It's an invasive test. Not a lot of people are comfortable doing it. Um, uh, it is uh, something also that you don't just sort of get a number and decide, okay, now you have compartment syndrome. Uh, people who do follow absolute numbers will use a number of greater than 30, uh, but more people have found that uh, a delta P uh, is a more uh, reliable way to go about it. So what that is, is if your diastolic pressure minus the compartment pressure is less than 30, 
uh, then you have a problem. Meaning, like if your diastolic pressure is 90 and your compartment pressure is 35, then you're probably fine. Okay, but if that patient's diastolic pressure drops to 60 and now your compartment pressure is 35, well now now you have a problem, right? And of course the problem is diastolic pressure doesn't it's not a static thing either. So if the patient's perfusion pressure overall drops, well now that compartment pressure differential, uh, the delta P there becomes uh, narrower and now you have a problem. Similar to how how uh, you know that a lot of neurosurgeons think about uh, cerebral perfusion pressures. These occur most commonly in the leg and forearm, but they can also occur in the thigh, foot, arm, hand, and buttock. Um, they can occur in patients who are found down. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, you've probably seen some of these patients in the hospital. They uh, are a drug or alcohol-induced stupor, and they basically are down on the ground for hours uh, to the point that they get pressure necrosis, like, or not pressure necrosis, but they can get pre uh, prolonged pressure on one of the compartments that can lead to a compartment syndrome. And in those patients, they can actually get uh, rhabdomyolysis. And um, anyhow, um, so like I said about 10 times now, compartment syndrome is a surgical emergency. When a diagnosis is made, a misdiagnosis can lead to permanent muscle death, contractures, and um, lawsuits, unfortunately. All right, so um, I think I'll uh, stop there for uh, for this uh, s section, and then I'll, we'll pick up with open fractures in the next one. Thanks.